Good afternoon. As president-elect of the American Physical Society, I am pleased to introduce our next session of the annual leadership meeting. The upcoming panel discussion will focus on scientific misinformation and its evil twin, disinformation, the extent, causes, and impact, and what can be done about these issues. We'll close with remarks from APS CEO, John Bagger. But before we get to that, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this session, Frank Cessno. Frank is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. Previously, he served as Director of the school for 11 years. Frank spent over 30 years in journalism, serving as an anchor, White House correspondent, and host for CNN. Frank is also the creator of planetforward.org, a program that brings students and experts together to examine sustainable innovations and currently teaches classes in journalism ethics, interviewing, documentary, and sustainability reporting. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming Frank Cessna. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate the introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I wish we could all be together. Instead, I'm coming to you from my office at the George Washington University. This is uh, the pain and the peril of the, of the times in which we live. But I'm delighted to be here and to pull together this panel uh, around uh, mis and disinformation in science. I spent a lot of time working uh, with the sciences and, and people who are doing this work, communicating science. And this is now one of the greatest challenges we, we, we face. So let me bring the panelists uh, to you, introduce them to you. Start with Sarah Gorman. Uh, she's a public health and mental health expert. She's an author uh, and her book, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Your book uh, examines and your work examines the psychology of healthcare decision making, um, gets into public perceptions of risk and thinking about how we discriminate between valid and invalid science. So I think your, your, your work is incredibly relevant. Next, David Helfand. David is an astronomer and he works as a faculty member at Columbia University. He's been there for four decades. He's author of more than 200 scientific publications dedicated most of his pedagogical work to teaching science to non-science majors. We have a lot of non-science majors out there who are engaging or suffering from or being exposed to mis and disinformation. So that's that's really important. David, greetings to you. Thanks for joining. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Your book, A Survival Guide to the Misinformation Age, seems to be more relevant than ever right now, David. And provide some tools that informed citizens are going to need to deal with uh, this just incredible uh, tsunami of mis and disinformation. So we'll talk about that. I'm also very pleased to welcome a colleague here at GW, Neil Johnson. Uh, Neil is a professor of physics here at GW, heads up a, an initiative in complexity and data science. Uh, Neil is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a recipient of the 2018 Burton Award from, uh, from APS. Uh, so Neil, greetings to you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's delightful to have you. And your research uh, extends into the sort of the broad area of complex systems and how misinformation spreads across social networks. So we'll be talking about that. Christo Wilson uh, is an associate professor of, in the Curry College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern. He's a member of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute. Christo, you're with us. Can you say hi? Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here and I'm um, really looking forward to the conversation. And I realize that I, I think that's everybody that we've got here. Am I missing anybody else in our panelists? No, I think, I think not and I think we can get started. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing uh, a great deal of here is turning to the audience um, and hearing from the audience. We're gonna want your questions, but we're also gonna want your responses. So I wanna start with that right now, because we have some polling opportunities for you, the audience. And so I'd like to come to the first poll right off the bat now and ask you a question. And you'll see in your screen that you have an opportunity to respond pretty much in real time. How concerned are you about misinformation and disinformation? And, I'm, and we're asking specifically in science. So what is your level of, of concern uh, for, the, for, the, for, for mis and disinformation? Now you've got or responses that you should see. One, off the charts, extremely concerned. Two, or B, pretty worried, fairly concerned. 
C, not so much. We'll be okay. We'll get through this. D, it's overblown. You're not concerned at all. So go ahead and put your responses in. I'm trying to see where I'm going to see the, uh, the answers to this um, as we go here. Uh, so I'm not seeing the response uh, yet, but I hope to. Claudia, if you can share that. I know Claudia is working uh, the back channels with this. If we can put up responses when we see them. I'm not seeing the poll. So maybe we'll come back to that. The poll's up and people are voting. I put it up. Should be. Right. Are we able to see responses here? Because, boy, I'd love to see what people are saying. If not, you can give us the percentages and we'll share that. Frank, can you see those? Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So we've got 46% say they're extremely worried, uh, pretty worried. 47%, 47, 47. So it's tied. Not so much six. No one is saying it's overblown or not concerned. So pretty extremely worried. We're at, uh, if my math is good, 95%. David, let me start with you. How worried are you? How serious is the mis and disinformation problem in science? I'm existentially worried. That would be above your top one there. Existential. Wow. <laughs> Go ahead. Explain. You know, we always accuse uh, people who we think are easy targets for misinformation as living in their own little bubbles, their own little echo chambers on the web. But of course, we live in our own little bubble and our own little echo chamber as well. And I don't think we recognize the impact that misinformation and disinformation is having both on individual decisions and on the development of social policy. Christo, how bad is it? I agree. I think it's very bad. Um, you know, to the extent that all, pretty much all policy implications today flow through science, right? Having to understand the world. What we see from inside academia and what we think people understand and the information that we think they're being exposed to, and we, we really don't have a clue. We don't, what do you mean we don't have a clue? Meaning that we don't actually understand the information ecosystem very much anymore. Right, what people are actually encountering on platforms and what they believe to be fact. Um, we, we just don't understand that. And then you throw in bad actors who are weaponizing that ecosystem for their own ends uh, and the ability to actually give people facts and engage in fact-based discussion. I think it's getting, uh, it's getting bad, it's, it's worse. <laughs> And if I look over your shoulder, uh, Christo, at the superheroes you've got there, I think that suggests what you may think we are going to need to uh, prevail <laughs> over this, some superheroes. So, so um, Neil, let me come to you because Christo was saying we don't fully understand the ecosystem. That's actually what you study. And we're going to see what that looks like in a few minutes. But your 20,000 foot sense of this, how bad is it? Yeah, I think it is uh, very bad, but for very specific reasons, uh, we tend to think that it, it picks up on the previous comments. We think that if we could just deal with the bad actors, it would take care of it. What we don't realize is, of course, it's, it's like a science point. It's a, there's, a, there's a multiverse out there of platforms and they're interconnected and it isn't necessarily down to a few bad actors. And I'm particularly concerned for the next generation um, that are currently play, you know, on gaming platforms, things that, you know, none of us on the panel probably know much about. Um, but they, this multiverse where, um, you know, there's a lot of downtime where a lot of kids discuss a lot of things. And in, in that space, that emerging space over the next few years will be one which will, in my view, be flooded with, um, with this kind of problem. Sarah, to you, your book, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us. Is this mis- and disinformation literally killing us? Unfortunately, I think it is. And that's what I was going to say in response to your original question, which is that, you know, a part of the reason I'm so worried about misinformation is that it does have real consequences. So in the example of something like vaccine hesitancy, we do see that misinformation influences the health behaviors and decisions people engage in. And so it's not just something that they, you know, read and understand and convey to others, but it affects the way that they actually lead their lives. And so that can be very dangerous. Let's, let's kick this around for, for just a couple of minutes. 
Um, explain that a little bit more, Sarah, when you say this is how they lead their lives and it's dangerous. What exactly are you referring to? Well, I think it's a little bit of what people were talking about already about the information ecosystem. So even before the pandemic, we had a lot of science denialist tendencies. We had a lot of misinformation floating around and we had obviously a lot of, we already had a lot of polarization politically and, and in this country. And then we had a crisis and people sort of, which was COVID-19 and people sort of dug their heels into their identities, their political identities and you know their prior beliefs even further. And so there became this really strong rift between basically people who believe science and people who don't. And so it's become almost a way of life now. It's part of people's identity uh, in a way about how they process information, what bits of information they attend to and what they basically ignore. But is misinformation and disinformation part of people's identity? And if that's a part of your identity, are you actually proud that, that, that and aware that it's incorrect information? Or do you believe that's accurate information um, and others are calling it mis and disinformation? I think people believe it. Um, but it doesn't, they are capable of seeing what's wrong with it. And they often do understand the facts on a basic level, but they have a strong psychological and, you know, this identity pull to really um, just reinforce the false beliefs. David, let me come back to you. Um, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, you spend much of your time connecting non-scientists and science. You say your consideration of the effects of this is, is existential. What is there about science? Um, that, that makes this type of mis- and disinformation distinct or special or particularly concerning? Well, science has to do with discovering what actually exists in the material world outside of our heads. And yet everyone lives inside their heads, right? As Francis Crick said, your hopes, your dreams, your memories, your concept of free will are all just molecules running around in the electrical connections between the neurons in your brain. Um, but that's a very disturbing idea to people. In fact, I introduced that yesterday to my class. We were discussing a neuroscience topic. And indeed, the majority of these 18-year-old first-year students at Columbia rejected that notion. Now, that's not serious. What is serious, though, playing off what Sarah just said, is uh, a study that Dan Kahan at Yale did a few years ago on climate change. Uh, when he gave people three tests, one was their basic cognitive reasoning abilities and their quantitative reasoning skills. One was just some simple facts about climate change. And the third was about their political affiliation. And then he asked them, which, what is your assessment of the dangers of climate change on a scale of one to 10? You know, one is forget about it. 10 is like, it's a disaster. And what was fascinating was the people with the lowest quantitative reasoning skills and cognitive abilities shared the same information. Everybody had the same facts. But the left-wing and right-wing constituents were identical at about a three. And then as you went forward, they diverged until the left were at nine and the, and the right were at zero. And the conclusion of the paper is in a very simple but scary sentence. People use their cognitive reasoning abilities to reinforce their group identities, not to assess facts dispassionately. What do you take from that? I take that we're in big trouble. Christo, um, your sense of the, of, the, of the science connection here. I mean, certainly I've seen this in, in the world of journalism and, the, and the, all the stories that, that we cover now, and this has gotten worse over time, that the fundamentals, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan is overquoted, right? You're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your facts. So this is not new in a certain sense, but it seems to have intensified and gone up the food chain of those who are invoking their assertion that some information can be contested when in fact it is, it is, it is a fact. But talking about science here, talking about science, what do you see? So I think you're right. I mean, the science denial has been around forever as conspiracy thinking has been around forever. Um, you know, right, right wing talk radio, right? very powerful force. It's been around forever. But what's changed is the structure of, of our media platforms. Um, you know, if someone wants to deny climate change on, let's say, right-wing radio, right, you have a certain audience for that. If you wanted to enter the mainstream media, there were gatekeepers. 
but that's not really true anymore, right? Anyone can put anything on YouTube and it's now being recommended to random people, introducing them to these ideas that they never would have encountered before. And it all has a very homogenizing effect, right? Seeing it on Facebook lends, or seeing something on YouTube lends it a certain amount of credibility because the platform is viewed as credible. It's not so much who posted it on YouTube or who posted it on Facebook. It's the platform, right? The, the media being sort of the message. And I think that's what's really changed is the emergence of mega platforms, which both enable things to spread, but also sort of obfuscate the, the origins and intentions of different actors. Um, and this also speaks to the, the formation of strong partisan identities, right? It's not, when we look at when people share misinformation on social media, in many cases, they don't actually believe it or even read it, but it's about reinforcing a partisan identity, right? I'm part of this club. And those clubs, right, that social identity is very strong in these spaces. It's designed to build them. Neil, your thoughts on this, and in particular, the focus on science here? Yeah, I think um, that the key is really to work at it's picking up on that idea. We need to have a picture of this. We need to, I mean, because we can talk, everybody talks about, you know, um, the, the, you know, the medical society who had a disinformation, misinformation. But, but if you ask people, even people on this call, just draw on a napkin a picture of the universe of misinformation. What does it actually look like? You know, if we were discussing, and this being a physics related uh, discussion, I mean, we wouldn't have hypothetical discussions about what the universe looks like. We go and picture it, take pictures of it, look at it, you know, look at the structure on all scales. That I think is an absolutely crucial thing. And it's only then that you can see where science misinformation is more important or health misinformation is more important or where it turns into extremism of another kind or, you know, we need to map that out. Um, so you, you've that. actually done that. What a coincidence. <laughs> we, have done that. we have done that because, it, it, you know, in a way it's otherwise it's this kind of rhetorical thing. The social media platforms need to do more. What does more mean? So, so, so why don't we bring that up now, Neil, the video that you put together and, you, and the, the, the way you've tried to map this and, and illustrate it and talk us through it and talk us through what it is we're seeing and, and sure. what you have found in what I think you and I have talked about before is very asymmetrical warfare. Correct. Correct. So, yeah, we, to try and understand, we're physicists. We try to build a map. What does the map look like of the online battlefield, if you like? And so we tracked out um, across platforms. You're seeing across platforms here. The, um, uh, you know, um, Facebook is just one part of this. Can we bring, can we bring up the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can we bring up, let me ask uh, Claudia or, or our friends in, in, in AV here to bring up the, the video that you provided and you can speak over this. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Video is up. Okay, go ahead. I can't yeah, see yeah. it. But yeah. So it. on the upper left is a picture of the entire ecosystem across platforms and showing how they're interconnected and like bugs between neighboring yards. Information pass, misinformation passes between platforms. But if you, if we were to zoom in on that structure um, at different scales, you see different things going on. But by mapping out, so on the upper, upper right of the screen, it tends to be more misinformation connected with racism, connected with you know, things that are not so scientific. The lower left is all about vaccines, COVID, um, you know, the, the, the denying the, um, it, that whole, all of those stories are in this map of the universe, except it's a multiverse <laughs> because each platform only controls itself. Um, we had a recent PRL, Fis Fis Rev Letter, showing that the good news, there's some good news out of this, and that that is that the math of these kind of turbulence is exactly actually a generalization of something that most of the physics community, a lot of the people on this call know a lot more than me about, which is um, to do with shocks, Burgess-like equations, nonlinear wave equations. It, the, the way that that communities emerge discussing aspects of misinformation we've shown is follows that 
pretty much that same mathematics. And so there's an untapped source actually listening to this um, webinar today who um, could come in and, and immediately help given that we now have that data. So Neil, back to your, to your map there, what does that tell us about um, where this stuff is coming from, how pervasive it is, and how it's amplified across these platforms. Yeah, it shows us very clearly that um, one of the things that happens in, when there's moderation on one platform is that this begins to shift to another platform where it builds up a kind of, I don't want to use the word momentum among physicists, but you know what I mean by a momentum, builds up some kind of momentum. And then magically, not magically at all, by knowing the structure, you can see it appears back on that original platform, say Facebook. And Facebook, who only look at their own yard, suddenly can't work out why it's coming back, why it's coming back in that form. And it's coming back in a cleverer form because it's evolved because out on that other platform, it could, you know, it's like, what did we get kicked off this platform for? Let's not do that again. Let's go back. You know, we found misinformation, particularly related to um, the kind of science of, uh, you know, getting into kind of anthropology, these discussions, mis misquoting of science, um, being turned into other languages and then being put back into Facebook using kind of phonetics to get round Facebook's lookup table of bad stuff. It's fascinating. I should say, by the way, that here at GW, we're very focused on this kind of thing. And we have an Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics that's digging into where this stuff is coming from and what we can do about it and what the role and the responsibility of the uh, social media platforms uh, really are. But David, I want to come over to you. You're an astronomer. As you look at Neil's multiverse there, uh, how do you process that? What is What occurs to you? Yeah, I think it's really critical. And just to emphasize this point, I'm a founding member of the sciencecounts.org, which is an organization that the last five years has been tracking longitudinally uh, the public's attitude towards science and various aspects of that. Oh. Between 2019 and 2020, uh, we saw, and it was then verified by the Wellcome Foundation, who did a similar survey, a, a 10 or 12 percent increase in the, quote, trust in science, um, presumably as a development of the rapid development of the vaccines. And then, unfortunately, this past December, just a few weeks ago, we did another survey, and these are big surveys, 2,500 people demographically distributed appropriately. Uh, and the answer was, we're back below 2019. But in this survey, we asked people about their sources of information. And if you take the group under 35, uh, about 25% of them got their news and information. It was both news and information from network and or cable news. 50 to 60% got it from YouTube and Facebook. And 0 to 10% got it from print and NPR and standard radio. So that's part of the problem. It's, uh, you know, you could say it's a supply problem or demand problem. And we tend to think it's a supply problem. So we think that Facebook ought to censor people and stuff like that. But it's, it's sort of like illegal drugs. You know, it's not a supply problem. It's a demand problem. Okay. And we're not going to get around it by just, just uh, taking down misinformation. It, it, it is a striking thing. And when I talk to my journalism students, by the way, and I ask how many have ever bought a hard copy newspaper, the answer is zero. How many are watching network news? The answer is zero. However, I'm a little, I'm a little skeptical and I'm a little, I want to, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this about this leap to, well, 57% or whatever it is, is getting their news from social media. They may be getting NPR headlines from social media. They may be reading a New York Times story via social media but are they not answering that this is where I'm getting my news from? Uh, so uh, how much, how literally do we take that data? We just got this data in the last few days, so we have not gone through all of it yet. But uh, I don't think much NPR shows up on YouTube. Maybe it does. Not um, on YouTube. No, not on YouTube. But 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 but, but Facebook, it could, yes. But, but CNN does an interview yeah. that they might do. Uh, Sarah, can I come to you for just a minute? You know, thinking about Neil's mapping and the, just the, the, the dimension of this, um, how, how you take that. And then after this response, I'm going to come back to the audience with another question, another poll to the audience. So, Sarah? Yeah, I agree that it's really important to do that kind of mapping. Um, I think we tend to assume that 
you know, all universes of misinformation are the same. So vaccine hesitancy about COVID-19 and people who don't believe in cancer treatment are all the same people. And there's a lot of nuance there to what people's motivations are and who they're talking to and what these networks look like. So I think that it's really important um, in, in the beginning to, you know, right from the start to actually map out what's going on here. And then from there, that's the only way you can, you know, work on ways to address it. So Sarah, when you think of science, mis and disinformation, why, how is the mapping most valuable? What, what, and I know we'll talk about this later, how we actually address and mitigate some of these effects, but why is this mapping? Why, why are these origin points so important? Well, I think it's always helpful to see sort of where people start and where they end up and, you know, how, um, how these journeys are happening, because I think people couldn't sometimes couldn't even tell you how they got from A to B, but it's really important to understand where they were and what they were doing when they came across this misinformation and how it spread from them to someone else. Um, Because if you don't understand that ecosystem, you're not going to know the right places to intervene. Um, You're just going to kind of fire at at different, whatever cylinder you you think is right, but it's going to be sort of a shot in the dark and you might hit the wrong target. So I think that's it's important to know, you know, what you're what you're really going after in that. Before I go to this poll, I lied. I want to ask Neil one more question. Neil, back on your map for a second. Uh, you're granted an audience um, with Mark Zuckerberg, God forbid, and you get to walk in with your map and plunk that down on the desk and say, "I'm a physicist. I study complex systems. Here's the one thing you need to know. That this map tells us about." your organization and its role and responsibility in dis and misinformation. What would you tell them? What would you point to? So whether you like it or not, you're part of an ecosystem. You need to understand who you're connected to, who is Facebook connected to through its users and who connects back into Facebook. And it's the one question they never, it's the one point I'm always amazed he never, they never raise. We've had good discussions with Facebook. They, they think they're the world. To some degree they are. But the, their weakness comes from the fact that, that that is actually their weakness, that they're one yard in a set of neighborhoods that bugs travel between. And the bugs will go out and the bugs will come back in. And although they've got the biggest yard, they depend on the other platforms because their users also use the other platforms. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but the point is it's like, you're not the only kid on the block. So, and, and it's, it's it, and as that's their strength, that's, but that's also a strength because once you know which other universes you're connected to, you'll know the paths that will come back into, because otherwise you're just kind of playing whack-a-mole. Right. Let me go to uh, this next poll and to the audience now, and this will come up and we'd like your responses on this because we want to talk about this. This, this is where it gets a little personal. And the question is, do you think you have been the target or in the middle of mis and dis- disinformation or mis and disinformation that reflects your work or impacts on your work? Um, answer A is yes, no, not sure, or you've encountered misinformation, but not directly related to your work. So um, we're really trying to get a sense as to whether and how this has gotten close to you personally, um, whether it's a paper that you've published, a, a talk that you've given, or, or some you know, element of science that you're directly involved with and, and whether and how that ends up somehow in the public sphere in this map that, that Neil has shown us um, in, in, in that space. If we've got results, perhaps we can see those. Um, Claudia, if you share those with us, I'd be very interested to see what people are saying. Have you or your work been directly in, involved in mis or disinformation over the subject of that? So 41% say they've been in, they've encountered it, but not in their work. Wow. 24% say, so a quarter of people here say they've been involved, 20, uh, been, been engaged in that or been subject to that. 26, 25%, no, but about a quarter. Um, as we see the m- numbers moving around a bit. Um, Neil, your response to this? Quarter of the people here, their work directly subject to this? Yeah, I mean, I since we publish in the area, you know, we try to publish in physics journals, but we, it often makes a story in the in the news, and that gets out. I do receive uh, emails every day asking me about, and some of them get into equation two of something or other because, it, and 
I mean, it, 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 it's hard to respond because that it, it, it doesn't go away. And unfortunately your response then get, can get shared into a community. It gets pasted into a community and suddenly you've now got 30 people. Yeah, yeah. So it's Sarah, not out, yeah. Sarah, I understand you, you've been on the receiving end of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, I also get the emails uh, all the time for sure. And I struggle with, you know, should I respond to this? I'm, I advocate for dealing with these issues, but I never feel like, you know, I'm going to have a response that's going to make a difference. But I think what you're referring to is a story I shared with you earlier um, about a, a piece I wrote about guns, um, which always gets people really vocal and worked up. And there was a, a, a story that in the comments that just picked up speed um, my father and I, who wrote the book together, um, were also listed, you know, as co-authors on this on this article about guns and, um, you know. And, this, and your father does what for a living? He's a psychiatrist. Okay. <laughs> um, and so people decided that even though it's said in our bios that we're a father daughter team, they were posting that we were really uh, married and that my father, you know, that he had left his wife while I, and I was a graduate student. And this whole sort of story about how we were caught up in this, you know, immoral activity to, to in order to, you know, character assassination to just sort of get to the point that we nobody should listen to anything we say. And it was very interesting because there were a lot of comments and nowhere did anyone just even insert that like, you know, right above it says that these people are a father daughter team. And I also didn't get my PhD at Columbia and like a whole other set of things that were just blatantly incorrect. Um, but it just showed how, you know, what was driving that was the, the stance that people had about the gun issue. And it didn't matter how close the real information was. They had access to the real information, but it didn't matter. And does that still circulate out there? And is that still an issue for you? Or? I haven't seen comments like that exactly since then. But, um, you know, I get all kinds of personal attacks. I get anti-Semitic comments. And anytime I mention Trump in an article, I get anti-Semitic comments. And, I mean, anything like that will just come up. David, you've studied the, some of the longitudinal data on trust in science, as, as, as you've referenced. Where, where, where are we and where are we going here? But you have to be very careful how you ask the question, because if you ask people, do you trust scientists or do you respect scientists? They we're pretty high compared to congressmen or, uh, you know, business leaders. Um, but if you be careful then, what you're comparing yourself to <laughs> yes, I, journalists, yeah, journalists don't do very well. Yeah, forget them, too. <laughs> but um, if you start asking questions about do they are you confident that they always provide advice that's disinterested and in the public interest? And does it matter if the scientists are at a university or at a private company or in the government? Uh, then you start to see big differences amongst different segments of the demographics, but also differences in general between the, the actual getting down to how do scientists affect my life kind of story. Uh, so it's you have to be the, the Pew Foundation has issued these surveys, you know, for 30 years about do you trust science and scientists always do well. But it's, if you dig a little deeper, it's, it's a little more complicated. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience. and I want to incorporate some of them in because they're relevant here. And this one, David, I would put to you because it's on this topic, really. It's sort of a follow up. And that is how much has the partisan political character of misinformation and conspiracies changed? Uh, and why. And, and for example, till recently, anti-vaxxers were not consistently left or right, but now the movement seems to have a much more partisan political character. How does that uh, factor in to this longitudinal study on trusted science, do you think? Yeah, well, it's true. Anti-vaxxers 10 years ago uh, were largely left, actually, on the left, not on the right. Um, and that was all changed, of course, by the by the politicization of everything in 2016. Um, we only have data that goes back to 2016, so I, I can't say what the very long picture looks like. Anybody else want to jump in on that, Christo? No, Barbara, or uh, Sarah? Yeah, I was, I was gonna say that it used to be anti-vaxxers were really focused on the childhood vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, and they were left, you know, they kind of went with this idea about natural and natural immunity and that sort of thing. 
Um, and then, you know, it's, it's really switched to, to right wing, but I would say that it's not really clear sort of where things are going to fall out for different vaccines. So different vaccines form, there are different movements around each one. And so the, the anti-vax movement at a, as a whole is actually a very mixed group still. Crystal, what I do want to come to you to, uh, to ask you about is um, what we know and what we can get from uh, the uh, social media platforms, the data that we need. This is one of the things that this Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics that I mentioned is working so hard on is access to data. What do we know and what are they sharing and, and what level, you know, Zuckerberg has said before Congress, go ahead, regulate us. So there's something there, but how much do we know and how much do we not know about what's really taking place and what they know? But they know quite a bit uh, because the platforms are driven by ads, right? So measuring people's behavior in great laborious detail is very much the bread and butter. What do we know externally is very little. If you go into the social media literature, there's plenty on Twitter, and that's because Twitter is fairly open about letting people look at the content flowing around on the platform. But even that has limits. And measuring the engagement, who actually sees things. Um, Twitter is more algorithmically curated now, and we don't know how those systems work. Um, so then when you move to something like YouTube, sure, you can crawl the platform and see kind of what videos are there. But what's being actually recommended to people? What channels have people subscribed to? And what, what is the actual information diet of real human beings? We have no idea. Uh, the same with Facebook. You know, Facebook is particularly adversarial when it comes to trying to collect this ecologically valid data about what do the algorithms actually show to people and how are people engaging with it? We, have, we don't know anything. Neil, does your mapping shed some light on this? And Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say actually we do know a lot about that now um, because, yeah, you can't... The problem with something like finding out something um, on Facebook, say, through CrowdTangle, which is a commercially available product. I mean, that's great for businesses and things, but it doesn't... You know, that's a kind of... That's a black box query system. So you've got no idea whether the links are biased or, you know, what, what it's telling you. So we've done the laborious job. This is all funded um, by um, um, Minerva Project, which um, that, that's what's produced a lot of this research. Um, we've, we've been, and we've been doing it since 2011, mapping this out um, link by link, community by community. Some AI tools we use, we try to use machine learning of where the links are and what the, what the content is, trying to discover very laborious work. But actually, we know more, and we know more, and this gets back to the face. We know more than you can know more than Facebook because Facebook only cares about things in its own yard. You can like, know more than Facebook because you know who is link. Who you know, for example, the anti-vaxxers, the whole communities of parents went off of Facebook to um, Telegram and Gab, um, and you know were very vocal on it. They went off into that because you know, they're protecting children and they've heard that on Gab, there's a whole group of people. I don't want to get into political stuff, but you know, who else is save the children? It's on, and it's on Gab. So off they go to Gab. Now, Facebook knows nothing about that because Facebook looks at what goes on in Facebook. So you can do that. And this is why I think it's, you know, it's like there's no social media entity is going to do this by themselves. No government really understands this. In some sense, it's the science community that have got to do the science of it, to look at the system as a whole. You know, you wouldn't discuss a percolation problem if you didn't know, you know, roughly the extent of the system. I mean, it, and it's, it's, in some sense, it's like a percolation problem. And, um, you know, I noticed in the chat, people have talked about, I mean, I don't want to get off onto bots now, but, uh, you know, there's a, a connected topic there with AI and bots, but we'll get onto that later. Um, speaking of the chat, uh, David, I'd like to come over to you with a comment that someone made, I think probably in the, in the, when you were talking about trust in science, and the, and the comment is as follows, as a scientist, this is from one of our uh, audience members, as a scientist, anytime I hear the words scientists believe, I assume a political agenda is being pursued. Belief is not science. Independently verifiable interpretations of data is. We cannot rely on trust. This person writes trust is often abused. 
empower people to have healthy skepticism and discernment. What's your response to that? Yes, I, I 100% agree with that. And one of the first things I do in my classes of, with non-science students is to remove the pejorative uh, uh, notion of skepticism as something that's negative. That <laughs> skepticism is something that's essential for living a life in a technologically saturated age and try to cultivate that uh, through time. So for example, there's a course that I developed that is now required of every entering freshman at Columbia. And a set of the assignments are to take a news article reporting on some scientific discovery, go back to the original article, learn how to read a scientific article, and then critique the news article as to how <laughs> accurate or inaccurate it was. And just having them do that two or three times in a term really changes their consumption habits for media. That's a really good point. And I think I'd like to actually follow up for a second on your notion of skepticism. We call it healthy skepticism, and it is healthy, and it's very much a part of journalism. And one of the things I say to people who are consuming media is if that media doesn't have a healthy skepticism component in it, if it isn't questioning and challenging, then that's not actually credible and somewhat professional, if I can use that term, and I use it guardedly, uh, certainly not journalism, because that's what journalism do. We talk about holding the powerful to account. Well, that applies to science, too. If this is based in science, how do we know? What is the uncertainty around it? And the uncertainty is a, is a big component of that. Sarah, you want to comment on this, this notion of, of, of trust? And I mean, if, if we're going to empower people to have healthy skepticism and discernment, boy, that's, that's a big public education campaign. Yeah, for sure. I've been very interested in this question of trust lately. And there's been some interesting literature to suggest that mm -hmm. trust in scientists has been maintained at, at a higher level than you'd think in this country, which is encouraging. Trust in the healthcare institutions and physicians may, may have taken a hit. But I mean, I do think that skepticism is should be viewed in a positive light. I completely agree with that. When it comes to trust, I, I do think there needs to be a baseline level of trust that people have that where they feel that most scientists are acting with integrity for the most part. They should be able to question things when they're not sure. Um, but if, you know, having that baseline level of trust is important. I think the very, you know, that, that kind of suspicion that we see a lot of people having about COVID vaccines and, and you know, science, climate change and other scientific topics, I think that undermines people's ability to really um, absorb information and, and decide what they think and, and have that skeptical exchange as well. Really, really great, great question and comment to this very point that I just like from the audience that I'd like to, to share with you all. And then um, Sarah, why don't you lead the, lead the response to it? And then everybody else can weigh in if you'd like. Um, and here's the, here's the, the, the comment slash question. Someone asked me, where in our educational system we taught people to think critically, evaluate, acquire and analyze data and learn how science establishes fact and eliminates error. How would you answer our adjustments needed in this new information environment? Sarah, go first, and then we'll let everybody Yeah, else. I mean, I actually started out writing about this a lot in my book, and that was back in before 2016, 2015, 2014. Um, because I really feel that science education, especially at sort of the lower levels, can be a lot about sort of rote learning. And um, we not only teach kids, you know, we, we, we teach them that it's not interesting, that, that we don't teach them to love it. And we also teach them, you know, we, we end up not teaching them about really what the scientific process looks like, how it's messy and uncertain, and the kind of critical thinking we need to sort of make sense of all of that. And I do think there is good research out there to suggest that curiosity about science can actually be an antidote to some of the political polarization that, that we see. Um, that when people are curious about the information, they can set aside their um, identity politics a little bit more. So it's really important that we instill that interest at a young age. David? Yeah, curiosity is absolutely key. Every five-year-old has it, and our education system is designed to beat it out of them by the time they get to university. And that's that's a fundamental problem, because without curiosity, you're reduced to, as the previous questioner said, belief. And I always try to avoid that word when, I, when I'm talking about science. I don't talk about belief. I talk about what we know and what we don't know. There's another key point that, that Sarah mentioned, and that is uncertainty. And here we're fighting against something very fundamental, I think, in our, in our neural wiring. People don't like uncertainty. And 
science, of course, embraces uncertainty and quantifies uncertainty, and, and that's a very powerful thing. But people don't like uncertainty. And when you see the attacks on Fauci, when he correctly identifies the uncertainty in our knowledge about some stage of the process with the, with the COVID, um, it just turns off another few million people from science. Well, it's very interesting you mentioned that because in a lot of the work that I've done in the area of science communication and, and looking at how journalism and others grapple with it, I think this may be the central point. This may be the biggest, toughest thing because a whole notion of uncertainty and falsifiability is so baked into what science is and we learn incrementally, right? Um, and yet in storytelling, we want and they all lived happily ever after somehow. And there's there's an end to it. A story, I can't tell you the number of times I, I'll hear editors say, uh, and others, stories have beginning, middle, and ends. Um, and in politics, God knows no politician wants to say, well, I'm not really sure about this, but if we pass this bill, they don't, and this may change. So I just, and I wonder, David, how do we, how do we convey that? How, if, if this is the, if this is such a core issue, this is so basic to science, but so foreign to other stakeholders in this conversation. How do we bridge that huge chasm? Well, I wish I knew. Um, we do attempt to do that in this course I teach at Columbia. We should all um, take your course. <laughs> but but uh, but it's it's a real challenge. Um, you know, you can get people to do it in a classroom but can you get them to take it back to their dorm and to the cafeteria and to other places and actually employ it in their real lives? Uh, and, and that's a problem that after 45 years of effort, I don't seem to have solved. Neil, you study complex systems. You got any thoughts on this one? Yeah, well, actually, I, you know what it makes me think? Just think phys physics 101. There's probably a lot of people on this call know physics 101 or 100. You know, we, how many times do we drum into, you get this right, you got this wrong. And one of the things, like the, one of the most basic starting things is I drop two objects, you know, like, oh, you can't really see on it, but I drop my iPhone, which I'm not gonna do, and I drop a piece of paper. You know, the right answer from a 101 perspective is they arrive at the, at the ground at the same time. But every student's thinking, no, it doesn't. You know, there's some, I drop a piece of paper, it takes ages to get down there, and I drop my iPhone, it, it, it's down there in a second. Because, and so science is a little bit, you know, sometimes science is a little bit strange because, you know, it's hard to kind of pick up on what the essential features are rather than, oh, I heard my neighbor dropped a piece of paper and it didn't arrive the same time as the iPhone. Take that over to the vaccine. Oh, my neighbor got the, the vaccine and, you know, and then they, you know, they had a pain in their leg. Um, so, you know, science, I, I, I just feeding that into the conversation that, you know, this touches all of us in, and it's not just to do with the, um, you know, it's how we tell things that we quote unquote know. Christo, you've looked at um, different motivations that people have for sharing mis and disinformation. What are they? So you have your commercial actors. I mean, there's, there's a profit motive for someone like Alex Jones to peddle misinformation. They're, they're selling things off the back of this. Um, we can look at it in the larger sense of say a fossil fuel company invested in climate denial, right? And using online advertising platforms to disseminate this message again for a commercial purpose. Um, and then we can also talk about elite actors going for essentially power reasons, right? Like why would the president of a country engage in this information, right? This is about shifting power from one place to another um, and defeating opposing institutions. But then you also have individual actors, right? Neil's talked about communities that go other places. You know, the, the meme that goes viral on Facebook isn't born on Facebook. It's born in a place like 4chan. And, and those actors, they don't have a profit motive. They, they just want to cause havoc or they want to be seen or they're building some kind of community identity. So there's a variety of different reasons. And, you know, unfortunately that makes the the task of dealing with this hard, you know, the, if we say we need better moderation, that may work against elites or commercial entities, but that doesn't necessarily work against grassroots near do wells who are moving around. Um, so, you know, we really have to think what are the different motivations of these different groups and target interventions against each one appropriately. 
so that suggests a, a, a multiverse of, of interventions as well. Yeah, I agree. Well, Neil, thoughts on this? Yeah, and um, actually, the money one one thing we're looking at now is this emergence of um, blockchain social media, which is uh, social media that has no terms of service, has no owner, has, doesn't live anywhere really, and the data is there forever, which means you know offensive material will sit there forever because it's run off blockchain technology. And there it's monetized, just like uh, through a Bitcoin type of approach. And so we're seeing this emerging, we're seeing misinformation, we're seeing hate extremism exploding on these blockchain social media platforms that probably none of us actually could even name one. Um, I only know one because we're collecting data from them. So I, I do see this, um, so precisely to the point, this is, you know, it's back to the thing of the multiverse. You've got to know the map of it to do something about it. It's a battlefield. So without that map, can't do much. D David, there's a, there's a new word in, in, in our vocabulary about all of this, as I understand it. Apophenia, you want to talk about that? What, is, what does that mean and what's going on? Uh, yes, that's, that's our ability to know things that are not so, you might say. <laughs> it's our innate storytelling ability that we want to incorporate uh, information and, and I won't information, misinformation or disinformation uh, into a story where we have partial information and we want to complete that information into a story because that's what we spent 300,000 years on the plains of the Serengeti communicating with each other is through stories, right? And this unfortunately when we have this plethora of inputs that, that Neil's been describing, uh, ends up with a vast field of information available to construct conspiracy theories and, and disconnect from the physical reality of the world. The reason this didn't happen for 300,000 years of our brain's evolution on the plains of the Serengeti is because unless you were connected to the real world, you didn't survive very long. You know, if you collected the poisonous berries, you were eliminated from the gene pool. If you were uh, after the hungry lions instead of the antelopes, you were eliminated from the gene pool. <laughs> so we had a, a uh, comported well, our stories comported well with reality. Uh, whereas now, of course, we're protected from all those nasty insults. Uh, and But we haven't lost the desire to make everything into nice, neat stories that help with our identity and, and in particular our group identity. And what does this tell us then? about a potential response to all of this? Well, as an educator, I guess you're not gonna be surprised that I gotta say it has to be education. And Sarah's absolutely right. It has to start in kindergarten, not, not in university. So we're dealing with damaged goods when we start in university, um, but we have to do it throughout by cultivating curiosity and cultivating skepticism and cultivating uh, a fact-based reality. Okay, so here's a good provocative one from the audience that I'll ask you, since you're a scientist and you're in a university, and Neil and anybody else can chime in as well. Great question. How much do you think the political leanings of scientists themselves, parentheses, according to the, the, the author here, who sent the question, probably overwhelmingly liberal, uh, how much do these political leanings play into this issue? Should part of science diversity be about welcoming conservatives into the fold? Well, absolutely, um, but there is an asymmetry in that the liberal mindset, and I use this with a small l, uh, is open to information sort of by definition, whereas a conservative small c mindset might not be as open to information. So while of course we should welcome a political view should be irrelevant to whether one has someone as a con as a scientist colleague uh, in a university or anywhere else uh there there is an innate in my view asymmetry between small l liberal small l conservative in openness to new information and willingness to change one's views um it's it's i don't know linda greenhouse's column today in the new york times about uh about Breyer's resignation has an interesting point that he wasn't, you know, a strict constructionist or a non-strict constructionist. He was a fact-based journalist. And when he responded in 
dissent to the recent Supreme Court decision on the uh, OSHA rule about vaccinations for workers, he said, underlying everything else in this dispute is a single simple question. Who decides how much protection and of what kind American workers need from COVID-19? Is it an agency with expertise in workplace health and safety acting as Congress and the president authorized? Or is it a court lacking any knowledge of how to safeguard workplaces and insulated from responsibility for any damage it causes? And that's what we're lacking now in all of our institutions, a fact-based rational approach to questions that are put before us. Christo, thoughts on this? Yeah, I think this point is very well taken. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree that we need better science education and media literacy in general as an inoculation at the, the individual level, but I, we can't discount the, that trust and belief are always going to be part of this. You know, individual people don't just don't have enough time or interest to read in a scientific article or really dig into these topics. They need to rely on institutions, and so there there has to be some level of of trust. And that, so, but to, to get that trust, do those institutions need to go out and find more conservative scientists? I mean, I, I think David really summed this up. The, the scientific mindset is often incompatible with the big C conservative worldview. So I don't know how to find the person who says, I'm a political conservative and I've subscribed to, you know, no mask mandates and climate change is a hoax and integrate them into an institution that's built on assessing claims like that and is finding that those claims are false. Uh, anybody else got thoughts on this? Sarah? Yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical that that's the answer for all the reasons that were already cited, but mm -hmm. I think that I agree about the institutional trust being sort of at the center of this and there being probably more um, sort of soul searching among current scientists about where they might be biased um, and you know letting their political views sway them or their communications about their work. Um, and I think some of that transparency might also help. I wanna put up another poll here for, for the audience in terms of looking at what types of subject areas are most, you are most concerned about with respect to mis and, mis and disinformation. Uh, can we put that up um, so that I can see it maybe? <laughs> um, and then uh, ask you to, to, to weigh on, on, on this. Are you most concerned about mis or disinformation in the area of COVID or in climate change or any of these other topic areas? Because I wanna turn and, and, and look at that in just a minute and perhaps we can put the results up um, as, as we're getting them uh, and we'll see what, what people are, are weighing in. I mean, COVID, is such a dramatic thing. And we see that in real time. Um, this is very interesting. Moving around. So climate change and COVID kind of side by side, but more than half are, are concerned about a general erosion, of trust in science. David, that's huge. That's a lot of worry about people seeing the, 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 a general erosion of trust in science. Yeah, and that's what our recent data shows. And as I say, when you break down, you know, ask, don't ask the simple question, but you get into what kind of scientists talking about what kind of issues uh, trust erodes further. It's that that's that would be what I would have voted for in this: the general erosion of trust in science. Although even that word trust is a little tricky, because as someone else in the chat said, you know, I don't use the word believe when I talk about scientists believe things because that just sounds like it's a opinion. Uh, a political opinion or, or a, a colored opinion from some way or other. I, I think, you know, I, I heard a talk a few years ago by Bill Press, and he made a very important point that science has two components. One component is it's a fact discovery machine. I mean, we know how to find out stuff about the universe. And in fact, a lot of people are interested in those facts we find out about the universe. But then science is also a set of values in which we value rational, inductive, and deductive reasoning that we value evidence as supreme in deciding amongst our models, and that we take nature as the absolute arbiter of anything that we put forward. 
And you can talk to people about scientific discovery and the facts that we discover, and they might buy them and they might not buy them, but they find it sort of interesting. But people don't like you shoving your values down their throats because they have their value system, which may be different than yours. And so I think a little, a little humility in our communication with the public would go a long way to relieving some of our responsibility for these problems. What would that humility sound like? What do you mean? Well, I think you have to start talking to people with where they are, not with where you are. Uh, and that means perhaps putting a large picture like climate change into a local context. You know, what, what is the farmer of the Olagala uh, aquifer or, or out of the aquifer in the Central Valley of California, you know, how are they coping with the stresses that they're, they're dealing with? And talk about them, talk about their problems with them, not about your global climate models. Do you think scientists talk down to the general public, the lay public? Yes. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, do, and, and you do. And do you think that there's in this notion of humility, which is what mm -hmm. got me thinking about this, that there's something aside from tying it to the local component that scientists could do to express more humility in this process? Yeah, well, so on the final lecture of this course that's required of all Columbia students, I talk about science and I talk about in each area that we study what we know, what we don't know, and what we can't know, because there are some things we can't know through science. And first of all, recognizing that is step number one in humility. We're not claiming that science can know everything. For example, in climate change, I tell them, we can't know what the weather's going to be like on your graduation. And we will never be able to know that because it's a chaotic system which doesn't admit for prediction on timescales of four years. Um, and so just admitting that we don't know everything already and that there's even things that we can't know is, is a first step in the process. Sarah, I want to come over to you because, I, and I want to start this question with an, a confession <laughs> that I've been wrong about just about everything for the past few years. And when COVID first hit, I thought for sure, regardless of what anybody said or what Dr. Fauci or anybody else predicted, if you start see, started to see your friends, your relatives, people in your world get sick or God forbid have to be in the hospital or die, that we would come together with a certain set of facts and reality about what was happening in the world just as we do when we get sick and we go to the doctor we trust and we would try to act appropriately to be healthier. That doesn't seem to be what's happened. Why? Yeah, I saw a lot of speculation that the, the COVID pandemic would you know, bring people together, that it would teach people that we have to look out for each other, that we have to listen to the scientists and the health officials. And obviously that's not what happened at all which didn't surprise me um, based on, you know, what I've studied for, for years, it became a vehicle for people to further their viewpoints that were already very polarized. Um, it just became sort of an excuse to keep jumping on that bandwagon. But I do want to say so that people don't walk away with the most negative impression possible. Um, in, in my research on vaccine hesitancy around COVID, it is true that most people, it's not exactly what you see with sort of anti-vax around the childhood vaccines and things like that. Most people are citing that they're really fearful, they're concerned, but they're, they really are hesitant. They're, they're not really not sure. And there, there's a lot of delay, but not necessarily that people on the, on the broad scale are all saying that this vaccine is a conspiracy and I'll, I'll never get it and that sort of thing. So that is a little bit more encouraging. Um, but in terms of our response to the pandemic, I think it's just sort of a, a, a magnifying of, of things that were already happening. It's also a place, it seems to me, where David's reference to humility plays in, that we don't just leap to the sense that if you have this concern, you're an anti-science, anti-fact person, right. that there may be other considerations uh, in this. Uh, Neil, uh, your thoughts on, on, on this notion? Yeah. I wanted to pick up, uh, pick up on it because, uh, yeah, if we look into that, we, which we did do, look into that map at the communities that to pick up on the point about the anti-vax, um, the communities that were kind of helping grow that whole debate 
a lot of those communities were mainstream parenting communities because they were concerned they had to make decisions about their kids and what to do. And there wasn't a lot of scientific information by definition. You can't come out with results from a study every day. It takes a while to do studies. Um, and yet there were other communities supplying plenty of in information. And so what we saw is that there was, a, there was a massive growth in these kind of mainstream communities, parenting communities who usually be just worried about other things, number of hours of screen time and all this kind of thing. But people who trust each other in a group, tens of thousands who are looking, oh, we've seen that there's this group that has information. Now, some of those anti-vax getting to the humility some of those anti-vax, a lot of those anti-vax communities, it's, we have the wrong, wrong idea if we think of them as just kind of crazies. A lot of them were picking up on, for example, Pfizer's latest report or, you know, some paper in the Lancet or whatever, and they were looking for the limitations section of the paper. And they, in some sense, the limitations section is one of the things we're probably most proud of as scientists, although we don't like to write it down necessarily, but it kind of puts your, you put your study in context. This is what we could know. And it's getting back to what uh, you know, David was saying. This is what we didn't know. This is what we, but they were using that as a weakness when really that's the strength of, of a scientific study. Mm -hmm. If you know your limitations of your study, you, you ring fenced what you can and can't say. They were using that as, Oh, science doesn't know. And so it's a very, this, the, you know, it's, it's almost like educating people what to expect from science. Whereas if you'd read, if they read a paper maybe of limitations of there being life on Mars, ah, they don't get the chip, the fact that there's some life chance that there's life on Mars, everybody likes that. So this is, this is what was the point there is that it, th these were meaningful decisions that people had to make about their kids and what to do with them and what to, what to, how to avoid the disease. And so they were buying into this discussion, which were quite clever discussions on some of the anti-vax sites about picking apart the limitation sections of some of these scientific cases. Interesting. Christo, thoughts on this? You go into some of these fringe communities, one of the taglines that is incredibly common is do your research. Do your research. Do your research. That is the suggestion. And sometimes that means, you know, go watch a crank on YouTube, but Neil's absolutely right. Sometimes it means go look at the article and find that limitation right? or go find this archive paper that's not peer reviewed, but has, you know, contradictory evidence in it. So these aren't always people who are just accepting false information and beliefs from a figurehead. I mean, they're very invested in this idea of personal autonomy. Do your research come to your own conclusion. So, you know, we talked about things like literacy and breeding, you know, healthy skepticism, right? I, of course, I agree that we need those things, but we also have to be cognizant of how that can be weaponized or go astray. Yeah. Question, a very, a very important and provocative question from the audience that um, people want answers to. And I'm just going to read this and then Raise your hand, whoever wants to go first with this. How should we handle scientists using their credentials to legitimize misinformation? How should we handle scientists using their credentials to legitimize misinformation? Who dares take that first? Well, first, I think we probably have to look inward. What, what education did that person receive? I mean, how, how did they end up in a place where one, they're invested in some kind of false narrative, um, but two, now, now they're trying to build something on top of it. Um, I mean, that, that's a community failure to a certain extent. Sarah, what would you say to that question? It's actually quite common among sort of the charismatic leaders that we see leading anti-science movements that they are actually trained scientists. It's mm -hmm. often in an adjacent field. They're not quite in the field that they claim to be an expert in, but for most people, they don't really you know, see those differences. And so it becomes very persuasive that, look, this person has a PhD, they're a scientist, you know, they know what they're talking about. And well, I by think the way, by the way, TV yeah. bookers love that kind of thing, right? Because that ma makes the perfect talk yeah. show guest, right? Because you, you do an intro and it sounds like, boy, this person really knows what they're talking about. 
I think the best you can do is kind of try to educate people about the tactics that these people tend to use. They're very sort of surprisingly uniform. There's a lot of talk about I'm being pursued by the establishment. I have this fringe idea and now they're after me. You know, I'm this expert, but nobody believes me. And it becomes very attractive to people. But if they can see that, that it's a sort of a ploy, you know, hopefully that can help somewhat. And these people often do make a fortune. There's a real profit motive yeah, there. They well. right. often make a lot of money off of fake treatments and things like that. So. David, what do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's sort of an extreme example of the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, where you're, you're, you're the, the thing you're least knowledgeable and expert about is the thing you have most confidence in. And these people project that beautifully, which is not particularly uh, helpful. But it is, uh, as I guess Krista said, it's a community failure. And I saw this very dramatically many years ago when I worked with the ACLU on a creationist science case that the state of Arkansas was insisting that creation science be taught along with evolutionary biology or maybe in place of evolutionary biology. And I deposed this person with a PhD in physics from a fairly well-known state university who was a professor at a branch campus at that university who was a member of the Creation Science Research Institute. And you could see from looking at his background that he had a, an isolating, unsatisfying, you know, member of an army of graduate students measuring nuclear cross sections, you know, and to put in another table in somebody else's paper. Uh, but in the Creation Science Research Institute, he found this set of collaborators and they could write papers together and they had conferences and he, you know, he had found a community uh, that he could identify with, which happened to align with his personal religious beliefs. But it was, it's that failure to incorporate him into the scientific community when he was an undergraduate and a graduate student that led to this situation. Neil, we can't disbar scientists who say these things, can we? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting that what the word PhD and doctor can, you know, can, because, you know, it's the- And, to, and well, another word, tenure. <laughs> and, 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 and tenure, yeah. Um, you know, scientists disagree. That's what I love about the APS meetings. You know, you can have shout, people shouting in the hall at each other. We know that, that but that's the way science is done. But, it, it, you know, yeah, but the other person shouting isn't just coming in from a, you know, a parallel conference on a completely different topic. They know what they're talking about. And so, yeah, unfortunately, the people that get attention tend to be, you know, empty vessels make no sound, unfortunately, in that, in, in that sense. I want to take the conversation for our last 20 minutes to, a, to another very important place and, and get there by way of our final poll that we ask you, the audience. And that is, what do we do about this? So the poll question is very simple. Do you feel that you, as a scientist, should pay and play an active role in countering myths or disinformation? It's a simple yes, no question. Uh, there are some people who think that scientists now need to jump into this. Others who think that that automatically turns you into an advocate of some sort, and that could compromise your position as, as a scientist. So um, let's ask and see what, how people feel. Do you feel that, and make it personal, that you personally should play an active role in countering dis and misinformation? And, and we'll talk about what that might mean and how, that go, how we go about that. And let's put up the results as soon as we start to get them in, Claudia, if you wouldn't mind, and we can start seeing how people are, are arraying on that question. And it's pretty powerful. <laughs> it's pretty overwhelming here, uh, I would say. Uh, maybe 11%, you know, some, you're, you, you can see some of the, uh, some of the issues there. And, and it can be difficult, especially depending on what branch of science you're in and how much that's the, in the crosshairs of, of the public. Um, but yes is, is 86%. Um, Sarah, what do you think? You've, you've worked with APS and you've... Yeah tried to deal with what do we do about this? And, you know, it's an all hands on deck moment in many ways. I'm really, well, first of all, I'm heartened to see that people think that, you know, scientists should get involved because that's what I believe as well. And I think that's important. Um, you know, I think there are some sort of relatively simple and teachable techniques that my organization Critica has developed and that we train various groups in, including we did a training with APS last summer. And, you know, people find that these, they, they pick up on these techniques pretty naturally and they, 
are able to use them and they have success. Sometimes they don't always have success. It depends on how staunchly adamant the other person is about their viewpoint. But, um, you know, you can, people from different backgrounds can be trained from different scientific backgrounds can be trained to sort of intervene in these kinds of conversations that rely on misinformation and, and, um, you know, help to steer people more in the right direction. So we're, we're trying to do more studies on that. What do you train? You say you did a training. So what do you, what, what, what exactly? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm your student now. Tell me what to do. <laughs> well, there's sort of the theory behind it, which is that we rely on things like motivational interviewing and inoculation. So those are kind of communication techniques that help, um, that help you to both sort of expose people to things that they might encounter that are misinformation beforehand. So they're not so pulled in or to, you know, really talk to them about what their values and concerns are and why they're sort of engaging with the misinformation in the first place. And, and that helps to steer them out of it as well. So we train people on how to have those communications. We give them examples, we sort of act out for them, and then we make them do it in small groups, you know, and really practice. One person plays the person who has the misinformation and the other person plays the intervener. And we sort of help coach them through that process. And we've gotten feedback from these groups that we train that they that people are trying it on their own and they're having a good experience. Are they, tra- are they changing minds or just getting people to say, well, maybe I'll do my research? People have changed attitudes at the end of a lot of these conversations. What we're trying to determine now by doing some randomized controlled trials is whether there are changed health behaviors as well. Christo, uh, uh, you know, again, we may need to invoke those folks on the shelves behind you to do this, but what is your response as to, um, you know, how, how, do, how can we respond to this? This is the subject of an enormous amount of research and thought, obviously, but what are, what are your, what's your sense? What do you do about it? Yeah, so I'm very much focused on the kind of platform power side of this. Um, in my personal opinion, uh, I think what the research shows is that the platforms themselves are not doing enough. So I think you really have to come at this from both sides, right? There's things we need to be doing at the individual level, but we can't ignore the design decisions and the power of platforms. Platforms will say we're we're doing everything we can, or a lot anyway, and maybe not everything, but and they're throwing people off, and they're throwing some people off for life. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a pretty serious penalty to pay? Pay, and doesn't that have an effect? It does, but we have to look at how long those decisions took. You know, Dan Bongino has been on these platforms for years now, spewing various kinds of hate and misinformation, and he was just banned from YouTube this week, right? So the speed at which these things happen is glacial. Um, but you know, things that things that platforms can do in a concrete sense. What you know, one is greater access to data. They're often not even asking the right questions. They're they're not aware of what's happening off platform. They don't see things coming. They're caught flat footed. So having more eyes on this is helpful. Um, But I favor much more systemic measures as well. Things like breaking up platforms through antitrust. And we've, we've had fringe communities on the internet since the dawn of the internet, but their ability to cause havoc was somewhat limited. But when you can shift from you know, organizing a raid on, on 4chan or Gab and then going on Facebook and reaching policymakers and reaching huge numbers of people very, very quickly, that very much changes the dynamic, right? If, if Facebook was a bunch of separate platforms that dramatically reduces the ability to cause havoc at scale and has a natural sort of protective effect, Neil, would that work or, or, or would people who are determined to do this kind of thing just come up with the next layer of whatever AI to <laughs> and run the breakup of the gigantic platforms? Yeah, unfortunately, I think that, that that would be the case. We just have a more fragmented system that is still let yet interconnected and therefore there's percolation across it. Now, for me, I'd like to see, I'd love to see the equivalent of the SETI telescope thing where everybody contributes, everybody out there contributes a little story. They've said, oh, I saw this misinformation today. So you send it into a central, um, you know, compository. And then we take that map, which is just the prototype. And we begin to build that out. That's how you build the map of of any, you know, that's how physicists do physics. And so if we could gradually build that out strength no that connection's wrong that node isn't important anymore that one's died that one's been booted off we can't do that ourselves 
but collectively we could do it. And once you've got that, then you know, as, as so, you know, then you know where to go and intervene effectively rather than, you know, I don't want to touch a node that's way out in a network. I need one that's actually highly connected with others to make most bang for my buck, for my time, for my you know, effort. So, David, David in, the, in the area of solutions, a question from, from the audience in this very area. I think one of the issues is that politics and science get confused and mixed up. Political decisions are sometimes made without full scientific knowledge, this person writes, but the public isn't aware of that. How do we improve that? And is that an approach to dealing with this? Well, I just want to say I love Neil's idea here. It's good. Instead of citizen science, we'll call it citizen anti-science. <laughs> we can get everybody working on this problem. And I, the other point I wanted to make is that, that Sarah's statements are absolutely critical. Yes, I believe this is a responsibility of scientists, but sending them out there with no training, which most people get through their training as scientists, uh, is could be disastrous. <laughs> so I think training scientists to do this is critical. Training scientists as communicators right. and understanding the environment in which we operate. That's right. But in answer to your question, I mean, I give a lot of talks on climate change. So I inoculate myself against the charge that I'm just worried about climate change because I get money for it because I don't get money for it because I'm an astronomer. Right? But what I do is, and this can help address this issue of policy not based on science, is I label every slide with a little bubble that says fact or physics or uh, uh, feedback. And I describe what those are. A fact, to avoid epistemological argument, is a measurement of some property of the material world. Has no policy implications necessarily, has no economic import. It has no, no uh, religious significance. It's just a measurement we make with an assigned uncertainty that's vetted by skeptical peer review and preferably independently reproduced. And in separating out facts from what we should do, you're bad if you have a gas stove in your house. You know, today in the New York Times, it's an absurd article about how much gas leaks from stoves in houses um, contributing to climate change. Um, if you just list a bunch of facts, you can often get people to agree on some facts and then you can leave for discussion, you know, what we should do about it. I'm not an economist. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not sure what we should do about it. I'll admit that freely. But let me tell you what we do know and what we don't know and where the uncertainties lie, like in the feedback loops in the climate system. So, again, it's 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 another version of humility, just limiting yourself to what you think science can understand about the world and then leave the other things for discussion. We have just a few minutes remaining, and I'd like to give each of you a chance to kind of sum things up here a little bit. We've got a wonderful audience and, and a wonderful host organization here in APS, and we're, we're, we're speaking um, with some of the most brilliant and educated people on, on the planet. As we think critically about this, as you think critically about this, thinking back to the very first question that was asked here of the group and of you individually, how serious is the problem? David, you said existential. I mean, and most people seem to agree. What is the role that science can play now in addressing this? What is the role for organizations like APS? How, how forward deployed do we need to be? Are there new alliances? Are there different approaches to this problem that we need to be thinking about if we're going to move quickly enough at scale enough uh, to make a difference? Um, Neil, let me start with you since you're our, our complex systems guy. I think it's a unique opportunity for the physics community who are the only ones placed to do this, to map it out. We should be the ones that map it out. And once you've got it, you've got that, you're then the basis for every discussion about policy, regulation, et cetera. It's, other people can take care of that. But the APS, physicists, we can map things. We do that, we understand, we do maps of universes. Let's do it, let's do this. Okay, Christo? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we we already see congressional leaders talking about these issues. And if you've ever watched any of the uh, panels they have about this, I mean, it, they're not even engaged in the right issues. They don't even know how to talk about it. So giving them the information they need to then engage in the what are the values and what do we do about it discussion is crucial. David. 
So in 1957, we had an existential crisis, we thought, with the launch of Sputnik. And a lot of physicists got together and worked hard on the problem of teaching science in K through 12 schools. Now, whether they got it all right is another question. But nonetheless, they devoted a lot of energy to it. And I think this is an equally, uh, perhaps worse, existential problem. And I think we ought to invest. Some, I think I completely agree with Neil and Christo as to what, how we should apply our technical expertise to this problem. But I think we also need to provide an environment, a supportive environment, encouraging environment to people who are willing to take their undergraduate degrees in science and teach in K through 12 schools. And rather than beating curiosity out of five-year-olds, inspiring curiosity throughout their early education. Amen. Sarah, you get, you know, author of Denying to the Grave, you got our attention, you get the last word, and you train in this space. Yeah, so I think there is some really good science already about really serious, rigorous science about what are some methods to fight misinformation. And I think what uh, communities like APS need to do is really um, have, you know, look around you in your field, where is the misinformation or the misunderstandings about your field and about science that occur in your area? And commit to actually studying some of that and bringing it to the attention of the rest of us. And then, as I said before, you know, also commit to training your scientists to participate in evidence-based ma based methods to, um, you know, do away with misinformation as much as possible. Well, thank you all very much. And for what it's worth, a thought from me, you know, it's pretty grim out there right now. And as I look at the media world is the uh, you know, the conveyor belt for, for a lot of this stuff, it's, it's not terribly encouraging. But there are a lot of people and a lot of organizations working very hard on this, both in research and, you know, boots on the ground. And that's everything from APS, um, so wonderfully hosting a great conversation like this, to our Institute for Data Democracy and Politics here. I'm on the board of an organization called the Global Council for Science and the Environment. And the, the whole point there is how to get science into policymaking more and engage in some of these things. So one hopes that with these great efforts, we can make some progress or at least hold, <laughs> hold the damage at bay. But COVID and other things have, have divided us and made our polarization even worse. And we've got a very, very big and daunting task ahead of us. So to, to wonderful panelists, thank you all for your time today and for your insight and for your mapping and for, for, for all else and, and, and good luck to you. And I want to turn things over to um, CEO John Bagger. And, and John, thank you very much for the opportunity to have this conversation. It's been a real privilege. Well, thank you, Frank, and thank you, panel. What a terrific discussion. I now have the very happy duty to close the session by announcing a new APS project to combat scientific misinformation. This project is rooted in our mission to diffuse knowledge to the benefit of humanity. And it is also grounded in our values to uphold truth. We're calling it the Science Trust Project. As we have heard, scientific denial and misinformation are rapidly approaching crisis proportions. They are affecting our work, our funding, public opinion, and the well being of society. Many of you have asked APS to develop an activity to counter misinformation, a problem that has been exacerbated by the broad reach of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's through your input and the input of numerous experts across the sciences that we have developed the Science Trust Project. The Science Trust Project has several guiding principles. First, we want it to be a resource for training and cooperation among APS members who feel passionate and concerned about countering misinformation. We want it to be useful and practical. As such, we want it to be interactive and practice focused. If you can participate, come and prepare to take action. We want it to work. While organizations and institutions can and should help Countering scientific misinformation is best done at the individual level. And finally, we want to remember that we are partnering in a dialogue with human beings. And therefore we need to be guided by a spirit of humility, empathy, curiosity, cooperation, and mutual respect. 
for without them, we cannot succeed. So this, this initiative builds on, builds on a pilot project we ran last summer to test an approach to countering misinformation. You heard a bit about it in the session today. So as a next step, we will be holding a workshop focused on conversations around misinformation and climate change. It will consist of four interactive sessions and run consecutively over four weeks. We want to equip and empower the participants to converse productively about misinformation with friends, neighbors, families, and acquaintances. We want our participants to bring their own experience to the table. You don't need to be a social media star or a great public speaker to participate. Every little bit helps in being better informed is a terrific first step. So if you're interested in staying up to date on the project and possibly joining our inaugural workshop, please fill out the Google form linked in the chat. Or if you don't have time to participate and you'd like to donate to this important work, please email our development director, Kevin Case, K-A-S-E at APS.org. In conclusion, let me emphasize that there are no magic words to uproot misinformation or dissemble denialism. It will take real work. But our Science Trust Project is grounded on behavioral science, and it will be a proactive step towards science literacy, community engagement, and understanding. I hope you'll participate. I hope you're as excited as I am about the project and that you'll join us in working to uphold the values that we all hold dear. So thank you for your participation in this session and I hope to see you all again for the next session uh, on uh, international affairs in one hour. Take care, bye-bye.